Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Steve Rosted. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about cyclic test latency with tracing. I like those three late the tracing talks today. But before I go on, I always have to do this. Smile, everyone. It's a this is with an actual thing called a camera. You can't make phone calls with it. So. There we go. Right, it doesn't run Android. Perfect. Oh, wait, you got a lot. That light was in the way. Let me just do one more. This way. I'm used to, actually, the old, um, the cameras that used to crank, the yellow cameras, that you disposable ones where you cranked. I used to do that all the time with that. So you didn't know if your selfies were good until, like, you know, a month later when it came back. Anyway, um, again, cyclic test latency tracing. So I talk about, mostly about the libraries I've written uh, and how you could use that to analyze uh, your tracing and why things are wrong. So quick overview, hopefully everyone here, oh, it's, I just ask, how many here, people here that do not know about cyclic test? Um, I can't see, hold on a second. So there's one hand, a couple hands. So cyclic tests, real quick overview, written by Thomas Gleichner over here. Um, it's basically a test that you know, executes to sleep. Ideally, we usually use nano sleep, by default it does. Uh, on wake up, it checks the time it woke up, and it basically compares when did it wake up to when it expected to wake up, and then reports the difference. Um, has several options you could do. Um, it's very, has a lot of features to it. Uh, I always use it with just one set of options, but there's a lot of other people who could do things. You create histograms, uh, you know, run on every CPU or run on uh, separate things, whatever. You could use even signals, see how signals work. Uh, and then you can make it break on a threshold. So, it is used by many people to see how the responsiveness of their real-time operating system. A uh, typical run, this is the options I usually use, is this cyclic test where it will run in the way those options, the first option is the priority of the threads, so I say run everything as, um, uh, C, or sorry, priority 80, and then the next one is the interval of two, 250 uh, microseconds, so each thread is going to sleep for 250 microseconds over and over and over and over again, and default is one millisecond. <clears throat> um, dash A means, okay, uh, set the affinity. Basically, I want to spread it, find out all the CPUs and run a thread on every single CPU So and set the affinity. So each thread is pinned onto a CPU while it's doing this. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's why I said available for processors. Uh, dash M is important. You want to make sure it's M locked. So you don't, right now, I don't want to worry about page faults faulting in. That could slow things down. So it does M lock all before it executes. And finally, uh, I guess it also has how different, um, what's the intervals, of microsecond, uh, the distance of the thread intervals from there. But anyway, there's a whole man page and everything, you can read about it. So tracing cyclic tests, because usually if something fails, you want to know why. So you want to trace it. And tracing, or cyclic tests has some um, helpful things, you could say dash B, microseconds, which basically says stop the trace if your latency is threshold is greater than X amount of time, and dash dash trace marks also tells cyclic test when this happens, write that information into the ring buffer so you know in the ring buffer, the, uh, the tracing ring buffer in the kernel, uh, where, where the issue happened. So that way it's easy, you know what CPU happened on and you can kind of find it. So by adding that options, and I ran this for a while, and I ran this not on a real-time kernel, I want to stress that because um, the real-time kernel is actually getting quite stable and good. You could run this, a lot of times people run cyclic tests on the preempt RT kernel for weeks and it never hits the threshold, which is actually good, it means it works. So I know that the non-preempt real-time kernel, well, it just, you know, the best thing is not a real-time kernel, so you're gonna have latencies. So I just said, you know what, I'm, for this test, for, to describe this, I'm not actually debugging something, I just wanna show you what happens if I run cyclic tests on the normal vanilla Linux kernel, and I'm going to break it at 100 microseconds. So if 100 microseconds, um, if it wakes up and it's longer than 100 microseconds before it actually runs, break. So this is actually normal on a normal Linux kernel. Um, so after I did this, I did trace command show. So basically trace CMD, trace command, is a utility I wrote that reads the tracing ring buffer uh, from the Linux kernel. And trace command show, uh, everything I'm using right now is this. You can actually do this if you just go into the tracefs directory, which is located in slash sys slash kernel slash tracing. If you cd to that, you could do basically everything trace command could do just from the kernel command line, as uh, the whole tracing infrastructure in Linux kernel was made so we could actually use it with BusyBox. 
But I like to use TraceMD, and especially since this talk is going to be talking about the data file that it uses, so I need to use it anyway. So everything's focused on TraceMD. It's also easier to show. But when I did this, uh, it shows, shows you the output of the trace file in the, uh, that trace of S directory. And it shows you right there that what you'll see the line there that has um, what's called cyclic test wrote into the kernel that it did hit latency threshold. It was 561 microseconds when it had the threshold of 100 microseconds. So, so with trace cyclic test when it first ran, um, it actually added a bunch of events. It enabled the events by itself. It didn't require any external thing. If you put the dash B, it just enabled a bunch of events. But it was really hard to control what events it enabled, and sometimes you wanted new events and such. So it couldn't keep up with the actual work that was going on in the tracing system. So what we did was we ripped out all the tracing infrastructure from cyclic tests and said, screw it, TraceMD is made to enable all these events, it's more flexible, it keeps up with the tracing system, especially since the person who is the maintainer of the you know, tracing system in the kernel, also the maintainer of TraceMD. So we used that, so we removed everything from there, and, but we kept the trace marker, because that's actually very useful. <clears throat> so now it's expected if you're going to use tracing with trace, uh, cyclic tests, use trace command before. And this is what it looks like. So you do trace command start, Start just means just start the things. Don't re it's not going to actually write, write, write it to a file or anything. It just starts it. The tracing infrastructure inside the kernel is a, um, what's it called, a overwrite ring buffer. So you don't need a reader. It's not a producer consumer. It just will keep constantly overwrite. And so you do that first, and then you pass cyclic tests as the final parameter, because trace command start will actually could execute uh, the application as well. And now when it breaks, and the, well here I just enabled a few events. I enabled the sched switch event, the sched waking event, all timer events. So inside the um, tracing current, or the sys, or sorry, the kernel's tracing uh, structure, there is individual events, and all the individual events are grouped by like a system of events. So here on TraceMD, you could specify either an individual event or a system event and it will figure it out. So here, like sked switch and sked waking are both individual events. Timer is a subsystem. It enables all the timer events. And IRQ, I'm enabling all the IRQ events and IRQ vector events. And then I kick off cyclic test. And now when I do trace command show, you see a lot more data here. And this got glare, so I might have to need to read this. So what do I do after that? So in the old days, when I used to work for Red Hat, I <clears throat> had to debug a lot of instances because we were develop we were working with helping develop the real time kernel for the Red Hat distribution. When there was a bug, when someone reported it, we had or we ran cyclic tests for over like a week, and every so often it would fail. So we had to say, okay, why did it break that th 100 microsecond threshold? Or so we would then run tracing just like you saw, and then I would always do trace command export. Export, you could, if by default, we'll just write to trace.dat, but here I wanted to give it a special name so I don't accidentally delete it if I do another trace command export. So I did dash O to write it to trace cycle dot dat. So now it extracts all the data from the ring buffer and puts it into a dot dat file. So if I do a report, it gives me all that data. Dash L, by the way, shows the latency information, which is this part right over here. Um, if you see the mouse, yep. um, that's the latency tracing information, which the first number is the CPU that it's on. The second one is D is if interrupts are uh, enabled or disabled. D means it's disabled. N means that it's need reschedule is set. So basically when a task in the kernel needs to be scheduled, a flag gets set called need resched. That means something wants to run. The scheduler should be called. If not, it's a latency. Uh, H means you're in a hard real-time environment. If it's an S, it means a soft, or sorry, hard IRQ environment. S means a soft IRQ environment. And the, this number is the preempt, um, whether or not preempt, preemption is disabled or not. Uh, one is yes, so it's a preempt count, so it's nested. Uh, the last number, which shouldn't, is it, there is migrate disable, which is used only by a few things. So, where am I? Uh, doo -doo -doo. Oh, so I noticed down here at the bottom, uh, you'll see the trace marker right. It's, remember, it wrote it in there, so it's still available in your uh, output file right here, and I noticed that it's CPU 1. 
So now I only care about CPU one because CPU one is where the problem is. So here I go, okay, trace command report with dash dash CPU one, which tells me I want only, only show me CPU one on my output. So it's a lot easier to see everything. From here, I could see the sketch where the sketch switch took place, where, where, uh, where cyclic test got scheduled and the timestamp that it got scheduled at. And I would go back, so this is actually what I used to do manually when I was back at Red Hat. I would just sit there, look at the schedule, look at when the waking happened. Then I go and like, okay, here's the timer that went off. So I look at, it shows you the timer pointer. So I said, okay, we have to go back and find out where was that timer set. So uh, where it triggered, because I could see back on the, you know, the last timer, I could see where the cyclic test was woken up. So I have to then go look at the timer pointer to go back, find where the timer set, where it was set. And also it shows you the now, which is what was how the HR timers programs the clock. And then up in the start, you'll see where it um, was set. So analyzing uh, tracing data is actually pretty straightforward. You know, you just kind of like walk through the events backwards to find out where the issues are. But it can also be very tedious. Um, the, once you start narrowing down the issue, so you enable more events and you do more, it becomes quite tedious and you start looking more and more into it. And you have to concentrate on everything that takes place and it starts, you get lost, you have to take notes and such and like that. But I always said this should be automated. I kept doing this and I found out that I was doing the exact same thing over and over and over again, looking for the same things over and over again. It seems like this sounds like it should be automation. So I once told Clark Williams, my task lead at Red Hat, you know what, I need to automate this. Well, I finally got around to doing it yesterday. Sorry, Saturday. <laughs> and I don't work for Red Hat anymore. <laughs> I did it for this. By the way, I had a 12 hour layover in JFK on Saturday, and that's where I started writing the code that's in this presentation. So I wrote the code first, and then yesterday on my seven hour layover in Amsterdam, I wrote the presentation. So introducing libtracemd. So this is what the main talk about is using libtracemd, which is a way to read the tracing.dat file to for an uh, analysis and you can do a bunch of things. I'm actually gonna walk through how I did that. Um, <clears throat> it will eventually be able to write trace that DAF files, but currently it doesn't. It's also built on top of libtracefs and libtracevent. Libtracefs is everything that interacts with the, lib, or the tracefs directory, which is how you enable all the tracing within the kernel. Uh, libtracevent is how you parse the events, the raw data. So it gives you the information uh, inside the kernel. There's format files, or actually in the libtracefs, you'll see format files to figure out how to you use that format file to read the binary data from the ring buffer, and the format file will tell you how to actually create that so you can read it in human form. And all that information is in www.trace-cmd.org. There's a nice little pony there, a long story about the pony, but um, the man pages, everything's hopefully well documented. So this is the code I wrote on Saturday. So I started off with, um, this shows you how easy this is, okay? Hopefully you guys are familiar with C, this is written in C. There is actually trace marker, I guess, that actually is written as a Python backend for this. So to open the file, I just do, okay, you create a trace command input structure, a handle, and you say trace command open the file, flags zero is just keep me the deep default operations. It, there's plugins that are added, so you don't care about the flags, but just open a file. That's how easy it is. Uh, the tep is a handler. It's the trace event parser. It's part of the lib trace event. Um, directory. It's how to parse the raw events. You're going to kind of need that. So you, when you do the open file, uh, the trace.dat file has all the formats and it will, you could create a, um, a handler on how to parse all the raw data that you're going to need later. So you need the handle for that. And then I call this init data because I have my own little data structure that I'm going to use for this program. The data structure here is uh, simply just stores a bunch of events. So for every event that I had um, you'll see that uh, the trace marker I want, the sketch, sketch switch event, the sketch waking event, or wake up event, there's two of them. Um, HR timer expire, actually, yeah. Um, the HR timer start events, those are events within the timer group. And also the fields, how to parse the fields. So I just, this is just more of an information only type of thing. You don't really need to know this, you just kind of like, okay, I need this information, so you just create a structure, and I'll show you how easy it is kind of to fill it. This is how easy it is to fill it. It's, it looks like a lot, but it's basically doing the same thing over thing. All you do is like you say from the tep handler, you say find the event. Like the first one is I know the print, the trace marker is the F trace print. So I said, give me the marker event. Um, give me the sked switch event, sked waking event, sked wake up event. 
And here I actually said, just use one or the other. Um, give, me the PI, give me how to parse the PID. So the TEP find field will say, from the waking, wake up directory, find the PID, where the, uh, give me a descriptor on how to extract the process ID that the wake up event woke up. So when the wake up event triggers, it'll have a process ID of who it's waking up. This gives me the information on that. And then the things about the HR timer expires. Um, I want the expire, the, the HR, remember that HR timer thing? I had the pointer to the uh, descriptor that I'm gonna have to use to find the previous, to match the start and the uh, trigger of the uh, HR timer event. The timer now, I want that now field that says this is when I expected, so I want that now as well. And same thing for the start, and I want to know where the expires is, because that's uh, the expires event is when it expected to expire or where it set the clock to expire at this time. So I'm going to use the now and expires to know the actual, um, be able to use that to actually convert it to uh, nanoseconds or the timestamps that the tracer uses. So next thing I do is I call this trace command iterate events reverse. So basically I'm telling the, go to the end of the trace.dat file and start walking backwards. And for every single event, call this function called ftrace trace marker. And then null and zero means I want, these, this is the uh, CPU mask. So if you put null and zero, it means I want every event on every single CPU. I'm going to pass my data field that I had, and this false here is do you want to continue where you left off? I want to start at the very end, so I pass in false. It'll jump me all the way to the very end of the file and start right here. Now, once I execute this, it's going to call this function for every single event. So here's that trace marker event. So when I get this, the first thing I do is, okay, it passes in the handle, whoops, and I'm going to get the tep field. Then I'm going to just get the marker from my data field. And if the marker, if this does not equal the marker that I'm looking for, because right now I'm, the first thing we look for is that uh, marker that cyclic test wrote into the kernel. So I want to find that first. So if it's not the marker, I just say ignore it. And then I'm going to, this is just a uh, easy way of the trace seek file, or this trace seek is also in the kernel. It's a way to pass strings. And with this tep print event here, this is a way to actually write the information from the marker. So this will actually parse the event of the print. When you had the print, it will parse that string. The memory that you, that you saw, the HR timer, um, or the, sorry, the latency was greater than X. That will write that into this seek handler. And then I just say, you know, put in a slash zero null pointer. And then I'm going to look for that hit, you know, latency threshold. If it doesn't include that, this means that this is some other marker, and this is not the string you're looking for. So then once I say, okay, it has it, I do a scan F to extract the, the lat and threshold, and I'm going to also record the CPU of the, uh, where the event happened, because I only care about the CPU that it was on. So right here, I'm going to record the CPU, record the lat, record the threshold, and return one. Could return one or minus. When you return a non-zero, from this handler, it tells the iterator to stop where it is. So I'm done, I found my marker, I want it to stop. Next thing I do is now that I know what CPU it is, I'm going to set the CPU mask. So I'm going to set the CPU, say only um, give me, or only trace this CPU, because the next time I actually put here, you'll see CPU set CPU size, now it's going to iterate only on that CPU. So now I'm ignoring all the other CPUs because I know where the problem is, I'm just going to iterate on that one. So the next function I called was find sched. So I'm looking for the sched switch. I want to know when cyclic test was um, <clears throat> scheduled on. Again, I ignore anything that's not the sched switch marker. And then once I found it, I'm like, okay, I want to make sure that this is the, well, by the way, I to make this fit in the slides, I deleted all the error checking. So I did find the value of the PID uh, the next PID, because it has to make sure it matches the PID of, you know, the sketch switch. So I made sure it actually was the PID I was looking for. So yes, it was that before. Whoops. So I deleted the uh, error case when it wasn't, but I left in that code. And then I want to record the timestamp on when the sketch will happen. So I recorded the sketch switch happening. Next thing you do is I find the timer expires. Same thing. This time I just look for uh, the, uh, I extract the timer expire code get, or let's see, from the time, sorry, first I do is extract the, uh, what's it called, the, or I get the value of the HR timer pointer. This is the, the pointer to the HR timer because I need that to find where it was in, initialized. 
the timer, now I look for the now. Remember in that uh, print statement or in the, the trace event for the timer, it had the now, the now when it was. I need that because right here I get the time expire, I get the timestamp of this event, and now I want to be able to convert that now into the timestamp. So I just said, okay, give me, subtract the now from the current timestamp and save that as the timer delta because I'm going to use that back in the start. So now I know how to map where that now is to the actual trace data because I'm going to use that information later. Then I'm going to iterate to find the wake up that where the wake up event happened. Same thing, I'm doing the, 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 the same old thing. This is the most cut and paste from the same functions. That's how I created these. I just cut and paste to make the next one, mod tweak it. So I find the, uh, the PID that's woken up and when it, if it doesn't match, ignore it. So returning zero tells it to continue. Uh, otherwise I found it, I'm just gonna record the timestamp of the wake up and then I do tell the thing to stop iterating. Next thing, finally, I'm going to find where that timer was enabled. So I go all the way back and say, okay, same thing, um, skip over. I find the HR timer. If the HR timer matches the, the HR timer from the other one, if not, continue. This isn't the timer I'm looking for. And then once I found the timer, I'm going to extract the expires from that, you know, subtract it from the timer delta. So this is actually the, uh, the timestamp according to the tracing timestamps when it was expected to trigger. And then I, of course, I record when the start actually, the time that actually it was enabled. And then I'm going to print all this information for you. So I just print out, after I did all this, I got all the information I want, the expire, you know, when it was expected to expire, when it actually expired, the jitter between that difference, the wake up time, the difference when the wake up time from when it actually woke up or when the interrupt happened, you know, when it was scheduled, the time from the schedule to the, you know, the wake up and then the marker, the marker from the schedule. So there, you know, I do this, I run it, boom. It tells me it happened on CPU one, you know, threshold was 100, the latency is 121. And then here's the expected. By the way, since I just wrote this on Saturday, I didn't have time to format it nicely to put it into actual seconds because this is a, the actual nanoseconds in the timer. Usually I will parse this so you actually it would be like eight something dot. So this is actually the nanosecond timestamp that's in the trace data. So it tells me, all the expected, it was only 853 nanoseconds off from when it was expected to go off and when it actually did go off. So that's pretty good. Uh, the wake up time was, you know, from the time that it went off and woke up, 376 nanoseconds. Really, still pretty good. Schedule time, well, that was pretty big. 118, um, it happened 118 um, not microseconds from when it actually woke up and then here, um, the schedule time. So, easy to automate, but it also means we can do a hell of a lot more. Once you start automation, it means we add to it. So, hey, we got soft IRQs. What happens when we do about them? So, let's just add more information about soft IRQs. I'm going to make some of these soft IRQ lists to record some information about it. Um, and then in that case, it's going to record like the last time, next time. So, this is just, you don't really have to know it. By the way, I'm going to uh, show you how to get this code. This is up, I uploaded it. So. It just records the time when uh, soft IRQs queues were running. Um, I also have a way, since the trace event is only a number of vectors, I just said, here's a map to the actual vector that's in the trace event to the actual, what type of soft IRQ queue it is, you know, whether it's a timer, RCU, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I just inserted the initialization, same thing. Don't really have to go over this, just says initialize the events. And then in the find sked thing, I just said, okay, put in, just insert this handle soft error queue. And if it's a soft error queue event, it returns that it was a soft error queue. So it's not a sked switch event. So it doesn't, it did the work for whether or not, yeah, it doesn't need to do this type equals sked ID because it already, if this found a soft error queue, it knows that it's not. So it actually tells you to exit here. So in the handle soft error queue, um, here I get the information about the vector, uh, whether it's a start start event or if it's the exit soft IRQ exit event. I then um, get the vector, convert it, and then I run these. I don't actually have the code, I didn't add the code to my slides with so the start timer, end timer. All it is is just storing information of, you know, recording when it ha started and when it, uh, when it exited. So I could later print that information which just iterates the list of all the timers and prints, here's the time that it was running and where it happened. 
So now you'll see when I run this, it'll say soft error queues from the wake up to the sked. RCU ran one time for 2.5 microseconds. The other one was uh, sked, the sked uh, RCU triggered for 2.2 micro, uh, microseconds one time. That's the total length. So it, was just, it wasn't really uh, informative, but it just shows you that, yes, you could do that in case it was an issue. So it gives you an idea where things are. Where I'm sure RTLA has the similar information for all that, which you'll find out in the next talk. But let's say we want more information. I'm interested in locks, because honestly, when I've ever done these debugging, locks was always the biggest issue for um, delays. So can we trace locking? Of course we can. So here, I'm going to enable the function tracer and limit it to every single spin lock, <clears throat> spin unlock, spin try lock, spin or read lock, read unlock, read try locks, write locks, write try locks, and write unlocks. Uh, I put mutexes in there, but they were kind of useless. So these things actually disable preemption, so I care about them. So again, <clears throat> I threw in the information for the function tracer, and I also put in this lock list thing that's going to be the same thing like that uh, the RCU thing where it keeps track of time, and also I have the stack that I put in so I could, um, <clears throat> locks are, could be nested, so this kind of pushes in a stack. Ideally, I'm hoping that locks, it doesn't have to happen, but this code actually assumes that locks are released before, like in order, so if you grab a lock, A, B, you're gonna release B, then grab A, er, and then release A. It doesn't always happen in the kernel, and if that does, like, it, that could break this, but like I said, I wrote this in the 12-hour layover, so I didn't really have time to handle other cases. So here we go, I initialized the function tracing, and then at the end of, just after I went all the way up to found the start case, now I'm going to do trace command iterate events. You notice there's no reverse in there. This means I'm going forward now. So this, it's kind of like the, um, there's a cursor in that hand, handle that as you iterate through. So it left off at the start event or at the start when it enabled the uh, HR timer. Now I'm gonna start going through all the events forward, still using only on that same CPU, looking for all the locks that are grabbed. And inside here, I, I have this find locks, which will now, it also, because I have all the timestamps at this point for when you know everything happened, the markers and all that, if I hit the marker timestamp, I'm done, okay? I don't, don't need to trace anymore. But <clears throat> you know, here I, I put in the state in my, before the expires, the timer expires, the wake up, the sked switch. So I record the state that I'm in, and then I say, okay, handle locks. And then this will put it, depending on which uh, lock was held, um, I put in like a, a special state for um, what, where to store it. And whoops, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I test the function. I get the, um, okay, so the function pointer will tell me this, um, the IP and the parent IP, which I want both. And then I do tep find function, which will tell the uh, parser, the libtrace event, give me the function name for this uh, instruction pointer. So I actually, it could look at a, the IP address and tell you what function it belongs. It uses KL sims, which is stored in trace.dat. And then I say, okay, if it's not, uh, then I call this find start lock function, which will search for all the things I like, all the locks that start and if it finds it, great. If not, look for the stop locks and set a flag whether it's a start or stop. If it's a start function, I just want to say, okay, it's, a, it's one of the, uh, a lock was just taken. Just push it and return. And, and return one here because it's not, it's returning one back to uh, this guy. So it's not really, doesn't know if return. Anyway, it returns there. And otherwise, if it's a stop, it says, okay, this is where I care, a lock was held during something. I care about when the lock was released. Not really when it was grabbed, but when it was released. I could put more information about when it was grabbed too, but right now I'm caring about when it's released because that's in the time frame that I care about. And then I pop the stack, I go and I find, make sure that the lock matches the lock ID. I have a way of finding the IDs. And then I'm going to do the timers, to put the timer in when the lock was started and lock was ended. And this is, by the way, how to find this, my, that find start lock, by the way. Uh, I have uh, a lock array of all the types of locks, that's just the beginning, and then I do a search for if it matches one of these, you know, the raw the spin, raw spin, blah, 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 then, okay, if it finds it, great, break out, um, break out, whoops. 
And the stop, uh, once the find start lock, will look for that underscore with a lock or a try. That means a start. The, I didn't put in the slides for the find stop lock because it's the exact same function except it looks for just unlock. So at the end, I print this information for each release. And finally, this is what the print lock looks like. It just tells you like how long it was held for or what, where, who took the lock, what lock it was, and the length of time. And then finally, when I run this, I get all this information. So here it says locks taken from um, the release of start to, uh, what's it called? Lock, locks taken and released, actually, from the start to expected time. So when this means that when the expected time triggered to come off, this is the locks that were released. And it's nothing really big that I care about. It, this is all, again, nanoseconds, so it's not held for very long. Uh, from the time, from the expected time to the timer. Um, so when the, the, the lock triggered to when the timer or took off, it was only one lock. And then here's from, from the wake up to the sked. It, I find here, if you look at this guy right here, I'll play, yes, this one. It's a lock was held for 168 uh, microseconds. It was a raw spin lock and it was from this function. So now it actually points to the function that has that lock that I need to go investigate. So let's see if we want to trace all events. So we could probably do a lot more if we did that. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to find when I have all events enabled, just give me the biggest difference between two events. So here, instead of putting any events, I just put um, trace command has a special trigger dash E all just means enable everything. Believe it or not, it has preempt, preempt enable, preempt disable trace events. But since trace events usually take about um, 100 and between 100 and 200 nanoseconds per event, it really doesn't have that big overhead. It's a little bit of overhead, but if you notice, the timings aren't that big difference. But after a while, it did trigger. And here, I quote wrote this thing said, okay, record every, every event. So basically, it's, I'm not going to explain every little detail here. The, the, uh, you want to look at the code, it's fine, but I'm just going to explain what this does. It basically just keeps track of every event and then looks at the next event, and if it finds a, uh, a margin that's greater than the last gap, it records it, record, and it does this um, see, update buffer, which is that tep print event, which you saw earlier when we, remember when we did, we used this to find the print marker that it did to parse the, the latency, uh, the, the threshold and the, um, the latency from the marker that was written by cyclic test. But this thing says, okay, I'm going to record the com, the PID, the latency, time, boom, boom, boom. All this is how you print something that looks like, well, and then at the here, I'm going to print that information in the buffer. But if I run this here, that line, which is kind of useful, this looks just like a trace command output. That's how, that is this information here that was done, I just want to stress this again, from this TEP print event. So TEP print event allows you to pass in a normal uh, string like you did, but you could these are trigger or these are little um, options to say, hey, I want to extract from the record the, con uh, the name of the, uh, the process of the, ev that, the event, the process ID, the latency information, and all that, and print, and that gives you actually something that trace command would show. It to shows me, you know, 93 microseconds happened between these two events, and I look at it was from when uh, interrupts were enabled to, um, the next dev, dev, but you'll notice here that uh, in this location, preemption was disabled here. And there's a big gap. I bet you preemption was disabled through that whole time because preempt enable and disable were actually events that were traced. But anyway, that's the talk. <laughs> that was 95 slides. And this is the where you get the code. I'm going to upload these someplace. I don't know. Is there a place to upload these slides for? I never, I didn't. You probably had a link. Yeah. Okay. Sit. Sit. Send me and I can place. All okay, the, uh, yeah. I can send you the link too uh, because it's just right. Like, it's just Google. Yeah. It's just Google Docs. But yes. Questions? Please wait for the microphone. I know it's quite too much information. <laughs> <clears throat> Hello, my name is Alon. According to the last slides. Um, question about, uh, I, I'm not sure I saw um, 
I want to know about the candidates, the other task that is waiting for the locks. We yes. Remember, I only had 12 I hours to write it, this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No, actually, um, yes, exactly. Uh, one of the things I had, I had to actually do manually was to go find the lock owner and then try to do this. Now, that would require, well, we now have F probes, which actually we had to update this. So you could actually extract the first argument of the lock. So if I could find the, the actual lock that's doing that, throw that into the trace, and then I could write this code to go iterate back and actually just write the analysis saying, okay, I'm blocked on this lock, who owns it? And be able to read all the other CPUs at the and same who, time. Yeah, who wait for this? Yes, who's waiting for it? Because uh, I could also see who got, had it, because yeah, I'll right. know when they released. And that's something I also want to add to this. Mm -hmm. But this isn't, by the way, this utility, I'm more showing you what you could do. So right. you could right. actually add this functionality yeah, sure. from this code. Because right now, I work for Chrome OS now. I don't really do much for the real-time folks. So when I was at Red Hat, yes, I would have done this. But I'm not okay. with Red Hat anymore. So. That's why I'm doing this, and so I'm trying to encourage other people to implement it. Yeah, thank you, thank you <laughs> very much. Yes. Uh, from what you did, it looks like uh, it would be helpful to write uh, some, say, Python binding for uh, libtrace cmd. Do you have trace it? cruncher. Huh? Search for VMware trace cruncher. Ah, good. Okay. It already has bindings for Python. Okay. I just, I, I'm afraid of snakes. I prefer uh, oysters. I do Perl. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm also old school, so I'm more comfortable with, with plain C, but I know that yeah. people are really yes. uh, using Python these days. Yep. So what is the scope? Okay, you had, uh, you may have mentioned this, and I might have missed it, but... Um, when you're doing the delta between every event, is that scoped? So like it's the delta from every event on a particular CPU? Yeah, no, yes, actually I only looked for, I was only looking at the CPU that I was on. I still had it masked to that one CPU. Okay. Well, if you don't have it masked, what, does it just show you every? Um, well, if you didn't mask it to all the CPUs, you'd actually, you could have your, fun okay, so if I go back, uh, where's that? So, Oops, wait, I did the all iterator. Uh, oh, I didn't add it. Did I not post? I guess I forgot to put in the, uh, but anyway, the uh, where it calls, I try the, find one of the iterators. Yeah, so the iterator here, I pass in the CPU mask and then you know the find locks. And in find locks, it actually has the record and the CPU. So here you could actually, if you want to do your filtering here, you could do the CPU to see if, uh, filtering. By the way, uh, it's in the man pages, but I just want to stress this. Uh, if you notice that, let me go back to where I actually found the actual CPU. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch, wait. It's... Uh, find trace marker. Um, I use record CPU, because the record has the CPU it's from. Okay, so this is where it could be a little confusing, and tr um, when you do, there's two iterators, you can actually have more than one trace.dat file, and pass it into, and there's actually a trace, or trace command iterate events multi, where you pass an array of, uh, of trace.dat files. Like, so basically I use this for tracing VMs, so you could trace the host and several VMs and have them all interleaved if the time, time syncing is done correctly, which Trace Command has values for that. But in that case, the CPU is actually uh, a unique identifier for every single CPU. So if you're the second trace file, so if the first trace file had eight CPUs, the second trace file CPU, the CPU zero will be CPU eight in this function. So do not always trust the CPU is actually the CPU that represents the CPU. It actually is the unique identifier for the CPU for if you have multiple. If you have just, if you're just tracing one CPU or one, if you're only doing tracing one, um, uh, trace that data file, it will be the correct CPU. But if you have multiple ones, that's where you can have bugs. I know because I actually triggered it myself, but. Uh, 
the um, but always use the record CPU that will, uh, the record always has a CPU that it knows for that trace data file. Oops, there's no question. <clears throat> There's a question from a virtual attendee, John. Are you going to send the code upstream to cyclic test? Um, well, actually, well, cyclic test, oh, I think I know which John it is. <laughs> okay, sir. So, hi, John. Uh, yeah. Well, wait, I didn't modify cyclic test at all. This is actually just reading the data from it. If you want, uh, RT test maybe might want something like this. Or RTLA, yes, we add it to RTLA. But no, cyclic test, I didn't modify cyclic test at all. This is all trace command tracing uh, right from the very beginning. Um, uh, ch -ch -ch. This one, this is, the update was actually this command here, the trace command before it is what enabled everything. So cyclic test doesn't need to be modified. Any other questions? Whoop, one. Um, hello. So can you tell again, what is the big difference between your tool and RTLA? Um, can RTLA also trace logs, or is this a difference? Um, it will. No, okay, so the difference between RTLA and this, I'm not showing a tool. RTLA is a tool. What I'm showing is a library. So what I just did, I, I created a tool um, as to, for my presentation. So I'm, if someone else wants to take this and do whatever they want with it or incorporate it into RTLA, I'm just showing you the library interface. RTLA uses trace of S. Now if it, does, if it starts recording trace at death files, it could do the same thing. So I'm just showing the library interfaces. So the answer is there is no difference because RTLA, if it wants to do it, it can do it. So it's not a competitor. This is just um, showing you the infrastructure that RTLA uses. Yeah. I'm just replying on behalf of RTLA. Yeah. <laughs> RTLA is somehow the continuation of the work that Steven was doing and using the libraries and taking that to extreme optimization. Yeah. That's it. And using abstractions that we can lead uh, generalized for the latency of the system, even for the things that we didn't get on the sample. I was wondering, actually, in the schedule, we probably should add RTLA first and then this, because this RTLA is like the tool, and then this is kind of like a, a talk about some of the functionality that, or some of the code that helps implement something like yeah. RTLA. So basically, you could use this to create RTLA. And yes. RTLA, yeah. The, and, the, and that was the story. Yeah. <laughs> We need catch boxes. <laughs> so are these libraries in the current source tree, or where are they? Um, I posted them. Uh, no, it's in here somewhere. I'm oh, sorry, with 98 slides, it's kind of, here it is, right there. It's libtraceMD, okay. libtraceFS, go to tracecommand.org. They'll see there's a Git repository for each of these libraries. Okay. Oh, I forgot to say one caveat about this whole thing. Um, the trace iter iterator re reverse is still in patchwork. It hasn't been put into libtrace command yet. So if you download this today, it won't work unless you go to patchwork. The code, the, the iterator is there. Actually, I wanted to write this code because uh, if, once it goes into libtrace command, I'm, I'm just like Linus about I don't break ABI. So I, ABI, once it goes in the library, it's basically set in stone. So before, I like to test things out a bit before, I'll put up in patchwork. So right now I'm really, really comfortable, so the next release will include this, but currently, like I said, it's in patchwork. It's not in libtrace command. But if you go to uh, tracecommand.org, I think there's a link to the patchwork where you actually could find the libtrace uh, iterator or reverse and download it, install it, and Yes. Talk about just-in-time development. <laughs> and by the way, I wrote the trace command reverse for this talk. I just wanted to clarify, for this to work, you had to uh, reproduce the same latencies like three times? 
because you were running uh, with different parameters to grab more and more data? So, oh, you mean about the, like, the effect of latency? Um, actually, if you notice, it, like that's actually kind of try to mention that, even when I did enabled all events, which actually shocked me that it was really rather, um, I mean, look at the average here. Uh, the average, this is actually a true cut and paste from the, uh, me running it. So the average was like nine, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, uh, these are microseconds. Um, for that was from the time that it expected to be woken up to when it actually woke up. So it went through that whole thing. And let me go back to the very first one. Uh, okay, so it went from three microseconds to eight to nine. So that was because I enabled every event. So, okay, so it's interesting here, we actually look at my presentation to find. So this is with no events enabled. It's through, it was average of three. Uh, if I go, um, let's see where I started tracing here. The average was four or five when I was enabling uh, the sketch switch events and timers, IRQs, IRQ vectors. So it went up, to, it went up a microsecond in latency. Um, so, and then when I did the, started doing locks, I should have made it, I should have pointed that out when I was doing that here. Where's the lock? Uh, uh, here. It went to six microseconds when I did, enabled all the locks. So it's, so it went from three to six. So I added three microsecond latency overhead. And it's a pretty big path that it's doing. So that's pretty good. And you're grabbing every single lock. But the fact that it only went from six to eight with all events was actually, I was pretty impressed by that. Well, if you enable all function tracing, this six will probably turn to 20 because <laughs> it's tracing every single function. If you do function graph, the 20 will turn to 50 <laughs> or more. That's when you start increasing that um, break time by like uh, ex exponential. Was that? Yeah. Oh, wait, oh, what did I run it on? I ran it on just a normal uh, i7. So it's, it's several years old, I don't know. Uh, but I think it said like 3 gigahertz, 3.4 gigahertz, i7. Oops. Any other questions? Well, if not, well, thank you very much.